mentioned, I um, am a technologist and been at it several decades now. Um, and so, but I work in the area of libraries and museums. At Microsoft, my role is to look at the libraries and museums industry and, um, and what are the needs of that industry and how can technology be applied to further um, outcomes in, uh, in that particular industry. Microsoft is actually organized by industry. Uh, and so there are people like me who do it for transportation, who do it for finance, who do it for schools, universities, et cetera. Um, but I came to this role um, after um, my time at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where as Claire mentioned, um, I led digital transformation there for quite a number of years. Um, so let's, let's get started. You already know who I am. I'm based in Seattle um, and it is, uh, it is still dark here. So uh, sorry about the reflection in my glasses and, and hopefully, um, well, hopefully uh, it's more about the presentation and less about my glasses. So, um, but um, let's get started. So one of the things that I focus on at um, Microsoft and actually, frankly, when I was in the museum world as well is how do we help people discover collections? Um, and one of the, the great uh, privileges of my role before the pandemic was I spent a lot of time uh, visiting libraries and museums around the world. And I cannot tell you how often somebody took me down to their treasured rare books room um, or rare collections room or something like that and, um, and showed me some you know, this actually happened to me at the British Library. I remember this vividly and showed me some incredibly rare book, um, which clearly I couldn't touch. Um, I could just see it in the racks. Um, and we all were amazed at the fact that this had been preserved so long. But the contents were not available. Like people can't, you know, it's, it's only available to people who get to go visit which is only a few. And even then you can't see the contents. And even then you may not be able to understand the contents, right? Um, I wanna be very conscious in this conversation that I am coming from this from a technology perspective. Um, I'm in no way trained as a librarian or a researcher. Um, so um, feel free to challenge me on my, um, on my thoughts here. So I really thought about this, this issue of how do we improve discoverability? Um, it's something I heard a lot of from a lot of um, organizations that I talked of, talked about, which is, you know, how can we improve finding things in the collection? And how can we improve understanding relationships across the collection? And so, you know, my job is to marry <laughs> um, technology with um, problems and, um, and issues or constraints that exist in the um, in the libraries and museums world. And so I really thought about this. And, um, and so, as I said, we don't talk about the technology so much. We're not, we're not an organization, hopefully, <laughs> we don't claim to be an organization that says, here's a technology, you should use it, um, but much more coming from the angle of how does it solve a particular problem. And so I looked at, is in awestruck by a lot of these collections that I had seen around the world and really thought about how can we improve discovering more? Because we're really scratching the surface. And I hope that doesn't sound controversial, but we are scratching the surface in terms of what we can make available. And so when I look at this, I mean, you know, use this definition from lexico.com, which I think is the Oxford Dictionary. Um, it talked about the quality being able to be discovered or found. And that was really a guiding principle for me, which is how can we surface more things? Along the way, I also did um, a master's in data science um, and learned a lot about um, knowledge mining, um, which I'll talk about a little bit here and, um, and the use cases of that and how that can also help bring um, information to the surface, but in a way that's unexpected and not necessarily in the traditional ways that um, we may consume information. So I, I really, maybe naively, Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always curious about the world and I'm like, what if, what if we could increase the world's knowledge? And, and it's not that we have the knowledge, but how can we increase the visibility and the surfacing of it? And really, if we think about it, we only have a fraction. Um, 
as I said, I'm always curious about these things. Many, many years ago now, it's probably 15 years ago, um, the National Library of Australia, I'm Australian originally, the National Library of Australia brought out, um, uh, digitized all of its newspapers and then made them available on the internet. Um, but the challenge was that the OCR, the optical character recognition that was done at the time, um, in those days was not as good. Um, and so they introduced this idea that people from the general public could help correct the, um, the OCR. And I got into all that. I was like, I went crazy on there. I think I got a book from the prime minister for my efforts or something. Along the way, I discovered a lot of things about Australian history, um, Australian history in the, um, in the uh, colonial times um, that I had never been taught and was never aware of, was not written in the history books. Um, and so one particular one that I, you know, found out about was, uh, there's a thing called a bachelor tax. So apparently in the early 1900s, if you were a bachelor and you didn't get married, you had to pay an extra tax because that was your duty to society because women um, didn't have the independence that they have today. And I thought this was fascinating, never heard about it before. And I keep thinking about these ideas of how you start to surface knowledge that we, that is not written about in the books, um, that is in all of the world's media. So enough on that. Um, to putting my technology hat on, <laughs> I've worked in technology since the mid eighties um, and along, and it's been a real privilege to have lived through the era where I started working with mainframes and punch cards and, um, you know, had the opportunity in Australia in about the mid eighties when PCs only were introduced to Australia in around the mid eighties. Um, and was, PCs didn't exist when I was at university um, in the early eighties. And, and then I lived through the PC era, the internet era, the mobile era. We're now getting into the you know, virtual augmented metaverse era. There will be more, there are always more eras. And when I look at technology, it's almost always been about addressing a constraint of some sort. It's like, so I start with televisions, you know. Um, it used to be a time where you had to be home at a certain hour at a certain day to watch a certain show. And if you weren't there, you never had another opportunity to ever watch that show again. Um, which is really, when you think about it, really very different to what we experience today, where I can watch a show anywhere, anytime. Um, we actually had, uh, I hope I'm not dating myself too much here. We actually didn't have um, color television until I left high school. Um, so we had black and white television. I'm sure there was an era before my generation where there was no television, obviously there was. Um, then we had color television and then we got to the idea of you could record a TV show while you were out. So VHS came along sometime in the eighties, I think it was, um, VHS came along. Um, and then we get into DVDs and then we got into um, cable. And so cable um, TV, which frankly was late nineties by the time it hit Australia, um, was this idea you could watch a show anytime, anywhere, um, but only at the times that they told you if it wasn't quite any time, right? And then, you, and then you got into where we are today. So not to belabor the point, but we get into the way you can watch a show anytime, anywhere, um, on any channel, not any channel, but you get the idea, right? So, but it's always been about addressing constraints. And if you look at phones, it's the same thing. If you remember rotary phones, um, and then we got into the idea of, you know, people had, the only way you could get a phone call is if you were actually there when the phone rang. Uh, and then we got into people leaving voicemails. And then we got into the idea where we're almost at today where you don't even need a phone anymore because everyone tax. Um, so, but it's about addressing constraints. So I'm looking at this from two angles. What about the possibilities? for surfacing knowledge and what about addressing constraints? And one of the constraints is the description, how you describe um, collections, both in museums and libraries. And so metadata, as you all know, and I feel, um, <laughs> I realize I'm totally preaching the choir, metadata ha has been core to describing the collections to be able to solve that problem of, of discoverability. But now we have, so, and I'm not in any way suggesting metadata goes away, but now I'm saying there is so much more and there are also limitations of metadata. It takes time and it, it offers a certain perspective. Um, and clearly it's also not the full, in the case of a book or a document, it's not the full text. Um, so it's always going to have, and it's got a very limited space um, or limited limitations. So it's going to always have some, some um, 
some elements there that it's not perfect, but it's a very good solution. But then I'm like, so how do we, how about how do we add to metadata? And and then we look at other other media. So we're now living in a world. There always was audio and video, but maybe not always, but recent times. But the description of audio and video is really difficult, right? So if you try and transcribe audio, it takes at least four or five times for someone who's really qualified at it. It takes at least four or five, five times the actual length of the audio to do that by hand. Um, when you try and describe video, it's even more difficult because you get into things of like, well, this is a video around these topics um, and it has these speakers, et cetera. But what happens when you're someone like, um, I'm talking about the Imperial War Museum because I've worked with them um, here who have a whole video collection of from, from the wars. And there is video after video after video of um, scenes from the battlefields and who are those people and what are the trends and what are the patterns? It's very difficult to describe that. You can say that this is a video about a particular battle or about you know, whatnot, but how do you find all of the videos that have Winston Churchill in it or um, anybody else um, for that matter? Um, Catherine Devine, not that I mean any of those, but you know, name a person. How can you find all the instances that that person appears even if you don't know who that person is. And so you get into these kinds of sort of issues. And I like to take what we know from the um, from other industries. Um, and so this was, you know, sometimes commercial, um, they have the money to invest in innovation um, that is not necessarily available to the cultural sector, which is a very sad reflection, frankly. But, um, but then, so I heard about this company that, um, actually offered a service where if you wanted to find, they had all the archives of every fashion show ever. And if you wanted to find a particular model with a particular dress from a particular designer from like 1969 or 1951 or something like that, they offered a service where they could get that clip for you in like an hour. Now think about the size of those archives and the, and the challenge of trying to find those things. Um, so that like got, really got me into, well, how can we, how can we better understand video? Um, in a way that is more scalable. And, and also, frankly, how do you provide for multiple perspectives? So we have the perspective, I work a lot with museums and we have this idea in museum. So art is often described from the point of view of a curator and it's, it's described as something like, um, um, it was bought or gifted from this particular person, it was done by this artist, it's, um, it's a certain style, it uses these materials, right? But none of this tells you from a general public perspective or maybe another researcher's perspective, um, what, what you might actually um, be interested in. Is it a depiction of war? Um, sorry, I'm not focused on war. I'm just using it as an example. I've used it twice now though. But is it a depiction, you know, what are all the depictions of war over the years? Um, is it something that uses a very similar style? And these kinds of things is what the metadata that is used in art museums is not necessarily, it provides one perspective, but not multiple. I think the other thing that, you know, when we talk about um, these kinds of technologies and how they can more rapidly describe uh, collections, one of the first challenges that we often get, and rightfully so, is it's not perfect. So I will say my response to that is always, you know, well, technology improves every year. So the technology that you have in 2022 is, will be completely um, different to what it is in 2030. It'll be much better. It's always going to be better. Um, there is a chase for human parity, but we'll never get there, but we'll approach it. Um, but I think the thing to remember is also that the way that we experience um, knowledge today reading, listening, watching, um, in the case of you know, documents, videos, et cetera, or images, is not necessarily the way that you have to consume the knowledge that comes out of it. And so when we get into this topic of, of knowledge mining, and so I look at, you know, I've talked to many institutions that have extensive oral history um, libraries. And the challenge with oral histories is, you know, the assumption is that the use case is that you're going to um, uh, listen to it end to end, and therefore that the transcription needs to be perfect end to end. 
And it does from an accessibility point of view, absolutely. But from a knowledge mining point of view, knowledge mining is the process of abstracting out what are the key concepts, uh, what are the patterns, um, and trying to get more information about what is the content. And then not just looking at it across one document, but looking at it across a, a, set, of, um, a set of audio or a set of video. Um, and, and so I think sometimes perfection, we should absolutely search for perfection, but perfection we, there are other, other ways to consume this data and, and provide visibility. So when I talk about digital, what I'm, I often say is the way to apply digital is to do something you can't do in the physical world. And, and so, you know, I get into knowledge mining as something that's not easily, as easily done in the physical world. So how can we use that to understand the collections of an entire organization? Uh, and I'm going to get shortly into what happens when you take that beyond the organization. So, Apparently was the next slide. So we often look in the context of a single organization, but I, you know, I think my other dream is what happens when you start to bring the world's collections together. So you go beyond that into an entire country. You know, what are the collections of an entire country? What is the knowledge that can be mined from that? What does that tell us about history um, that we may not otherwise be aware of? What are the insights that we don't have today? Um, my mother used to teach me um, when I was young that, you know, history books are written from the perspective of, you know, the person who wrote them and those were inevitably the people in power um, or who had the access to reading, writing, um, publishing, all of those kinds of things. And so that there were other perspectives. So that always sort of stuck with me. Um, but I mean, you know, this is a, to me, the thing that gives me goosebumps in, in my job is thinking about what happens when you bring the knowledge of the world together and what will help us understand about the past um, and potentially the future um, that we might not otherwise have known because, you know, it's because of these limitations. So something to, something to ponder, and I'm really hopeful in the questions that we'll get some, some thoughts about, you know, what the challenges are there. The thing that got me to here was working in natural history museums. There's a natural history museum in every, uh, in every major city in the world, pretty much. Um, and they all have similar collections on the face of it from the general public, but they're not. What you, but when you start to look at something like, you know, an artist like um, Gainsborough, for example, um, or Monet or any, any artist, um, you can't see all the collections in one place and you can't compare and you can't. And so how can you do that? And digital allows you to do those kinds of things and analyze um, what the patterns are. And then of course, the other you know, topic um, that's very big at the moment and, and, and should be is this idea of accessibility. We've seen it during the pandemic. We've seen organizations realize that reaching out across um, digital channels um, for educational purposes, um, and I don't mean schools and universities, of course those, but I mean, you know, in terms of general public education, in terms of, um, just making these, this information available and consumable um, to people anywhere, anytime um, is a big thing. Uh, and, and something that really extends the mission of these organizations. So um, I often use the example of Italy. Uh, Italy culture is very important. Um, we work a lot with Italian, we work globally actually, but we work a lot with Italian organizations and Italian government. And um, it's very important to them that they take the culture of Italy to the world. And it's something that they've really realized during the pandemic is that not everyone can come to Italy, obviously, um, but what if they take Italy to the world? And so there are lots of great examples in the museum space there around uh, where they've taken that. And, and I think that there are equally examples around um, the knowledge um, of the world's um, and how do we bring that to the internet because the internet is the great delivery system here and then how do we make access available to anybody anytime um, and not just to those who have the privilege of, of um, being able to visit collections in person. Um, I realize that I'm probably way over time, but I, uh, but because I want to get to some questions and some discussion and show you some demos as well. Um, I'm going to, I won't go through this slide in too much because it's a little bit too technical, but these are the kinds of capabilities that we see with 
these technologies, um, which we call cognitive services. Um, but it's the types of things that you can do. It's, you know, speech to text, text to speech, translation, description, identifying objects, um, knowledge mining, being able to uh, abstract out the concepts and the key themes. Um, I'll leave this for your uh, for your reference later, but you know it is a lot of technologies, and they're very accessible, very quickly, and they're really designed at a level that is not necessarily requiring. Um, it's certainly not general public level, but it's not requiring as much technology expertise as you might think. So we have a lot of these kinds of services. This is a big thing in technology these days. Um, these services that are quite a lot more accessible to people who we would call citizen developers. Um, so not necessarily professional developers, but people who have the interest and ability to um, sort of incorporate these kinds of services. So, um, so there is a whole suite, it's growing, it's getting better every day. Um, and so something to consider. I want to show you a couple of quick examples and then we'll go into the discussion. So one is about, and I actually have these in demos, I just want to quickly um, walk through these. Uh, one is using computer vision to describe images. Um, so this is back to the, the conversation I had about what happens with the metadata when the metadata is around um, the, uh, the medium of the, of the painting, for example, or the metadata is around keywords in the, in the document or the book. Um, but then you can start to get into, um, so here we have like automatically generated tags, which you don't have to display, by the way. That's always something everyone worries about, which is what if I don't like those tags? Um, but, you know, the idea is it can generate automatically and it can run through, we did this with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it can run through uh, 20,000 images in an hour or something like that. It's pretty quick. Um, and also fairly, fairly inexpensive. It's like, um, sorry to use American currency, but it's like pennies um, for a thousand images or something like that. Um, we also have this idea of like, well, how do you create these relationships across um, images in a way that you could never scalably do with metadata? Um, and um, I'll get into this in the demos. We also have things like handwriting recognition. Um, so um, how can you, you know, you could say, see this document here has both typed and handwritten. So we can also transcribe handwritten. Um, and here's another example of where it's using handwritten. And here's an example here on the left where it's actually abstracting out all the concepts. Um, so this was not done manually. This is abstracting out all the concepts and the entire corpus of documents. And also you can obviously do typed content recognition. Um, and same idea as what we saw with the art. It's about what are the relationships. So in this particular case, this is about the files of the uh, JFK assassination. Um, so it's taking an entity that's often described here, Lee Harvey Oswald, and then what is that term most associated with? Um, and then this is the idea here, and you can apply this to anything, is, is getting this kind of a map allows you to rapidly explore what the possibilities are in terms of um, other closely related topics that you might not otherwise know. And certainly you can do this at significantly more speed. Um, and then we have um, this other example, which I'm gonna show you, which is video indexing. So this is it's a presentation I did uh, some time ago. Um, and what it does is uh, it actually analyzes the video fairly quickly and then brings out all the topics that I talked about um, and brings out the keywords and brings out, so it's not just a, just a transcript, which is also important, but it's also um, mining that for what are the key topics um, I talked about. And, and then obviously you can do that over a whole set of videos. So that gives you sort of those insights. I'm running through this quickly because I wanted to show you that and I'm over time, um, but I also want to get into some real life demo so you can actually see it. Um, so with that, thank you for this. We're gonna go into a chat with Claire and, um, and then I'm gonna show you some uh, live demos of some of those things. We'll stop sharing. Claire. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for that. It's great to see and I'm keen to some of these demos as well. So I wonder, you know, looking at your cognitive services and I think we're all looking at them go, that's quite a list. You know, for those of us with a big backlog of items where we haven't got the metadata we'd quite like for discovery, you know, where, I suppose, 
where would you say is a good place for us to start adopting yeah. some of these services? Well, I think you don't have to choose like I want this one and this one. You know, they were um, they were displayed in columns. So right, there was a set of services that are similar. So you can apply that service, and all of them will get applied at once. Um, so maybe that makes it a little easier and brings it down to like four or five. But I think it comes down to what is what is the thing that you and I always invite advisors not to do everything. What is the thing that you most want to achieve? Right? What is the problem that you're most trying to solve? Uh, and it could be something like, you know, um, keywords at speed, right? Like clearly writing keywords um, by manually, and I understand why, um, is, you know, time consuming, right? So how could you get keywords generated? And you don't have, you could consider those the first draft, right? If you're concerned about, you know, because that's always a concern, right? Clearly a computer is never going to have the expertise of, of a researcher, but it's a great first draft, right? Um, and eventually you'll build up confidence about it. So that could be like, let's just start with keywords. Uh, in the case of a video corpus, um, I would, you know, run through, um, you know, maybe it could be translation, right? Oh, or, or closed captioning is another one, right? Because that's the problem that everyone has. Again, treat it as a first draft, or it could be translation. Um, that's another great area of accessibility. So I think it's all about what's the, what's your biggest problem and and then picking that rather than trying to do everything that is available in the technology. I liken it to like if you have, maybe you're not like me, but if you have a, you know, a new iPhone or something like that, you know, or like every new release of software I go through and I'm like, what's all the features? How could I use them? Um, and, um, and I'm always fascinated by it. But realistically, you're only you're only going to use the ones that solve a problem for you that address some constraint. So just pick those, you know, just pick a handful. And what skills do you, um, we need in our libraries to be able to take these tools on, you know, that are coming through? It's not the barriers, not as good as it was, but there's still, I think, for a lot of us things, yeah. well, how exactly do I get started with these to get that first, first list of cues? I recommend and willing to be challenged on this that it, it gets done at an institutional level, right? So looking at the databases that an organization has and how you can apply, um, how you can apply this. So, you know, it, it, and, and, and an organization is going to need some level of a developer. Um, it doesn't need to be, you know, a whole team or anything like that, but there is, and I'm sure people are familiar here with this concept of APIs. It's basically an API that can, a service that can run and then can append data. Um, it doesn't damage your original data in any way. Um, and it, it appends data. And then you can decide if you want to use that data, make that data visible. But I often recommend that doing it with a pilot. Um, start with a, an area, someone who's willing and open-minded around the possibilities pilot it and see what it looks like on your data um, and see if it's actually valuable. But also I think, you know, the key here is it's not perfection. You know, I think it's like 80 or 90% sort of perfection these days. Um, it's a lot better than it used to be, which is at 50%. And it's always the, the question of, is it, is it better and faster than doing it manually? And then how can I use it? I don't have to, as I said, you know, we had we had a real issue in museums with well, I don't like those tags. <laughs> I don't know if we want to recommend. You know, um, so how can we how can we um, think about um, not surfacing those tags, but still using it in the searchability uh, and the discoverability, right? So you just don't have to make it visible. Yeah, so, yeah. And um, so a question here is where do we go to find out more about the different services and APIs? Yeah. So yeah, well, I probably should have put that in. The, you know, I'll, I'll resend you the deck with the link to it. Yeah. There is, um, and clearly I'm going to come at it from Microsoft's perspective, yeah. but you can come at it from any tech company's perspective. Um, we have a, a suite of services called Microsoft Cognitive Services, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the thing that I showed you. And I will send you, uh, put the link. I'll put the link in the chat in a minute um, and um, before the end. And and then, of course, every other company, I'm just going to be just about Microsoft. I mean, the other companies clearly offer these kind of, you know, Google, um, probably Amazon as well. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is that it's a set of technologies that could be used and I think is worthy of, of experimenting. So we'll put the link. 
it's very accessible, as I said. It's just, but it does require some technical mouse, but it's it's not um, it's not like you need a specialist in this area, right? Thank you. Do you want to go on to any of your demos, or do you want? Yeah, to let's do that. Let's do that. Um, let me share my. So I wanted to um, organize this earlier. I'll start, start with the JFK files. So, whoops. Good morning, Catherine, it's 6.30. <laughs> um, just trying to get this so that you can see my screen, right? So the story yeah. of the JFK files was, um, it's the corpus of documents that were released um, uh, several years ago now, um, three or four years ago. Um, I must have been on an anniversary when it was no longer uh, classified. So it is all the documents that were about the investigation from the US government, um, about the investigation of, of um, yeah, the, um, the assassination of JFK. And, and what it does is, as I said, showed you before, has all these documents um, and you can see that it is typed, handwritten, images, annotations on top of all sorts of things, right? Um, and what it's done is rapidly, as in like an hour or two, rapidly, um, gone through this and analyzed all of the contents. Um, and so I think traditionally we used to have typed content as being something that was OCR'd, right? Um, but now we can deal with so many other things, both, you know, handwriting, et cetera. And then what it's done is automatically generate tags. And these tags represent how often this, this entity appears. Um, and so this was not done by hand. This was done by computer and allows you to understand what the um, frequency is. So it's, it's in descending order. So clearly CIA, et cetera. Um, you know, is more frequent than Congress or Cuba, right, for example. But if you don't know, I realize in this example, people do know the history, right? But if you don't know the history, right, it may surprise you to find that Cuba was referenced, right? It may surprise you to find that New Orleans was a reference. Um, and so this is the idea of what I talk about knowledge mining, this is what effectively this is, is abstracting out the concepts. And it's not just one word concepts, it's, it's um, um, N-word concepts, um, and 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 then you could take any of these and you could explore it further. So I could take Cuba, and I can excuse me, and I can see here. Maybe I can. <laughs> let's take the let's take the obvious one, which is. Um, Oh, maybe this has stopped working. No. Oh, I've got it on my other one, so I don't know what happened, but usually it's what I showed you in that thing, which is it's going to generate a mind map type of a thing of what's the relationship of these terms to... Um, oh, I can't believe I should have checked that beforehand. I'm so sorry. Um, but it's going to show you what I had on that, that thing, which is a mind map of like how those terms are related to other terms and how those terms are related to terms. Um, but the thing that I often use when this demo is pick any country um, that I'm in. And I did this in Greece. I did this in, you know, clearly if I look for Australia, just only because I'm Australian. Um, oh, it's work now. Um, so Australia is most associated with topics around connected Russians and authenticating. Um, and then I could take any of these um, connected Russian and see what it's related to, et cetera. Um, but also I can see what are all the rep, what are all the documents? Oops. What are all the documents and all the references to the word Australia? Um, and this is where you're going to, you know, I'm just picking an, you know, an obvious term here, but this is where you're going to uncover things that maybe you didn't know. I did this in Greece where nobody in Greece expected there to be any references to, um, I'm sure there are plenty for um, the United Kingdom, right? But 
and it's going to pick up, you know, clearly any reference to Greece in here and then also be able to see back to this view. Here, how is Greece most associated with, was it most associated with Britain and Turkey? Um, and absolute certainty, whatever that means. Um, but you get this idea of like being able to rapidly explore data. And the real thing here is you can do this yourself, but the amount of time it would take you to get through thousands of documents to get this kind of analysis is the thing. And so even if you just want a quick understanding, or if you take something like oral histories, like a set of oral histories, quickly understand what is being discussed. That's, the, um, that's what I think is kind of the game changer here. Um, so that's documents. And then, of course, we also have the, um, the same with images. Um, so here is the example that I was using before, where this is the, here it says medium classifications edge. This is actually the metadata from the METS collection management system. These are the tags that were generated for this. Um, so here you can see it's talking about George Washington, because he's a, um, he's not a celebrity, but he's what we call a celebrity. He's like, he's a known person. You know, Winston Churchill would be another example. Um, and it's talking about um, boats and battle and army and things like that. So it's doing two things here. One is automatically tagging and then allowing you to do that same exploration, which I'll show you in a minute of similar things. And it's also being able to show you things that are similar to this. So from an art perspective, it's showing you things that are similar from a style perspective. So this painting down here is similar because of, um, you can see it's got similar colors and styles and things like that. One is a French painting and one is an American painting. And typically in a museum, um, the people who own the European collection and the people who curate the uh, American collection would not necessarily be aware of each other's collections or necessarily. So this allows us to look across collections, look across countries and all of these kinds of things. And this is visually similar because of its depiction of, you know, military and, uh, and battle. And then you have the same, you'll, you'll see it's very similar where I found it, here it is. Oops is the same idea that we saw in the other one where you can actually take that and then like, what are the what are the relationships? So here, these are related because of similar metadata that was previously defined, but these um, are um, related because it has similarities in the tags, tags or the visual style. Um, and so it's bringing another dimension to that level of exploration. Um, and then the last demo that I have is, um, this is this video one that I showed you. So I could only show you um, a little bit of it. So all I did was, uh, you can actually do this today if you wanted to. This requires no technical expertise. To... Good morning, good afternoon, good Oops. evening, everybody. Thanks. Sorry, that was something that I did a couple of years ago. So I upload the video into this, it's called videoindexer.ai. Um, it's a Microsoft uh, website, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, and you can just try this out yourself. And so you get an idea of what the technology is. And um, what it did was analyze this 20-minute uh, presentation that I did. Um, it doesn't know who I am, but it knows that I appeared <laughs> all the way through it. Um, and I can probably um, tag this as, as me at some point, and that it'll, it'll do that for future um, videos. But it also picked out uh, the, the key topics that I talked about. Let me expand this. So I talked about... Um, digital divide and augmented reality and technology and art museums and skills. Apparently I talked about skills as well. So yeah. um, it talked about the keywords. So it came up with all of these keywords that I talked about. Um, yeah, and so I actually talked about a Chinese proverb in that one. I didn't realize that it even came up and picked that up. Um, and I've forgotten the proverb now. I think it was something about um, a tree. The best time to plant a tree is now. The second best, no, best time to plant a tree was 200 years ago, the best time, second best time is now. That was what it was. But it's, you can see that it's actually picking up quite a level of detail um, around um, what I'm talking about. And then it's coming up with um, various labels, which again may or may not be useful. Um, Interestingly, this seems to be actually coming out of some of the slides that I had used. Hmm, interesting. 
And then it comes out with specific named entities that I referred to, you know, Clayton Christensen, Ray Wang, who's an analyst, um, brands that I talked about. And then it's, it's you know, I like this one. one only 2% of it was joy. Um, <laughs> but it comes up with a sentiment as well. But you can see now this runs pretty quickly. Uh, it also gives me a timeline. So it's going to give me a traditional transcript and all of this. But you can run any video to this today. So videoindexer.ai. Um, and get an idea about, and you get this idea that you can you can analyze videos much more quickly, and you can do the same with audio much more quickly than you could by hand, and get insights that are pretty good, um, and certainly better than um, if you did them ma manually. Not so much better quality, but um, eighty percent quality and much faster. Yeah, I'll stop sharing there. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that that service is free. Are the other services and those uh, APIs, are they free to use as well? Yep. Um, this, this particular service will let you do any video, one video at a time is free. Um, you may actually want to do it across multiple videos. Um, and um, But the other services, so these are to demonstrate the possibilities. Yeah. There is another one. Let me just quickly show you. I'll put it up on the screen. I'll put these links in before we leave as well. Um, is another one called computervision.ai. Oh, I guess that's not it. <laughs> I'll have to find the link, yeah. sorry. Um, forget that. Yeah. Something similar. Oh, customvision.ai, sorry. I'm just going to ask some questions while you're talking about a few. Um, and the other one related to sort of cost. Um, and how do you can small institutes particularly get funding to do these sort of works, you know, these sort of projects? I think there are, um, well, there's the, tip, the, the traditional grant system. I would love to see, and the UK is pretty good at doing this, of, I'd love to see more organizations coming together to approach you know, because it's similar skills, you don't need to repeat it in every institution. Mm -hmm. I realize that's a coordination, makes coordination more difficult. But I think that that's one, one opportunity. But I know that the, US, the UK is very good about aggregating, um, you know, or looking at things at a country level. Um, and so I think that that's one way to look at it. But I also let me just say that this is very inexpensive um, as a technologies go. And I'm, I really need to look up the right pricing, but the pricing is something like, one cent, one US cent for a thousand images, um, something like in that range or 10,000 images. It's not, um, now if you have a million images, that starts to get, <laughs> but we're not talking thousands and thousands of dollars here. This is not, um, and so I think that, it, I'm not gonna be naive and say it's within everybody's budget, but it's also not as expensive as you think um, compared to say other things. Um, so, I think one is the grant system, one is looking at it from a country level, you know, is this something that the United Kingdom, I would love to see more of this, because it's the most efficient way to do this, um, want to apply. And, and then I think there's also the experiment with it and see how much it costs, because you might find that it actually is very, you know, it's tens of dollars um, for your collection, for a very small institution, right? Yeah, and then we've had some questions around the joys of algorithms is that they can come with issues of um, equality and inclusion, et cetera. And, yeah. and how do Microsoft go about identifying those and com combating those, you know, that to yeah, make sure that we it's a, can build bias? Yeah. Um, well, Microsoft has a um, some very strict guidelines around how it uses AI. Um, it has, um, and there are lots of standards around it. Um, it can also... When I share this deck out, I'll, I'll put some of these links in. I probably should have thought about these beforehand um, so you can find out more. So I will say that, and I know I appreciate that I'm biased, um, is a very responsible company when it comes to um, thinking about those and the implications. Um, the challenge with, not the challenge, sorry. The more data something is trained with and the more applicable that data is, to, the more perspectives it can represent. Um, and so that's why I'm saying you should try it with your own data uh, first and see if it is useful. 
and it's just with a small subsection of your data and see if it is useful and see whether you have any concerns about um, the perspective that it brings, um, which I know sounds like, here's the reason why I'm saying that, right? Some collections, it's not going to make any sense for um, because um, it hasn't been trained on sufficient data <laughs> to do that. So we have the privilege at Microsoft of having access to a lot of data and training it for, you know, so we're going to probably have better trained models for a generalist um, application than, you know, any individual organization could have, except for many libraries, it's a very specialist. Um, topic. And so when you start to get into very specialist topics, you need to be trained in those topics to actually provide the perspective. So it's an issue. Um, I think sometimes we look at artificial intelligence and say that it is inherently bad because it's biased. But I think like everything, there is actually bias everywhere. And what we need to do is, so what, so where there is bias, it will be amplified. Uh, by AI, but it also has many benefits. And so I think it's all about taking a critical human eye at what is the output and how do we feel about that output and does it, and does it solve a problem for us? Um, but I, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult topic. I and mean, we try to do the best we can, um, but I don't, I know that there's often a reaction which is AI is inherently bad. It's more about Brad Smith, who is the president of, of Microsoft, wrote a book called Tools and Weapons. And he says that all technology has been a tool and or a weapon, and it's all about how you apply it. And so it's been the guiding principles of how we've approached it at Microsoft. Uh, but it's a valid question, absolutely. And have you worked with some libraries and museums? Because obviously they do have a lot of metadata to do that training of the tools as well, like taking- I would love to, I would love to. Um, I, I will admit I've, um, everyone usually says, well, this is great, but then the ability to move it into doing something with it um, or trying it out um, has been very limited, sadly, because for me, I see it as a very inexpensive, accessible technology that can make a big difference. Um, and, um, but yes, uh, so anyone who's interested here, I'm, I'm willing to talk, but most, um, but yeah, it's been hard to get that critical mass and interest in terms of actual um, doing something as opposed to, oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I can see lots of hands will be coming <laughs> soon. And then, um, yeah, there's another question here around sort of digital preservation, which is an issue that we're looking at. And obviously a lot of what we would like to preserve is developed by Microsoft tools. So is that something that Microsoft's looking at as well? How we preserve documents coming out of Word, Excel, etc. Outlook? Oh, you mean that kind of digital preservation, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I can't say that I can speak to that. That doesn't mean that Microsoft's 200,000 people. It doesn't mean that Microsoft isn't uh, working on that. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I'm qualified to respond. I'm sorry. And I hope I asked that question right, um, Arlene. Um, and then some questions. Yeah, we've had quite a lot come through about how the tags are generated. So do you know more about sort of what happens behind the scenes when it looks at those that, that yeah. video and images? So what it's doing is, you know, all, all of these kind, this artificial intelligence comes from a set of testing, a set of training data and training data that has been tagged with, you know, you can take this into millions and even billions of items, right, to get to it, you know, that has been previously tagged and said, this is, uh, this is a boat, right? <laughs> this is a um, military, you know, example or something like that. And then it looks for similarities. Um, and so it's what it's actually doing is in computer vision was actually doing is like doing a pixel by pixel kind of like um, analysis of something that looks similar to a boat. And then it's continually trained and got feedback um, until, and there are, you know, there are lots of standards that are set in data science around like what's an appropriately um, confidence level, confidence um, level for something that's been trained, which is why I keep coming back to, if you don't have the original training data, you're not gonna get anything useful. Um, and that's why we need more and more training data in specialist fields, why we need more and more training data in um, the areas that are under uh, represented in society so that we actually get better results. Um, 
And um, and so it's, um, sorry, and I forgot your question, I apologize, but um, I went off on a tangent, but it's, that's how, yes, the, what was the process? So one is about training data and then it's about applying that. So there is a whole, as I said, as, there's a whole science around how you tag, how you test, how you get confidence level, and you do, you know, training and you predictions against your test set, your predictions against real data. What is the difference and all those kinds of things. So it's a whole sort of like process. But the thing that technology can bring back to those constraints that I talked about earlier, technology can do this at speed. Um, it can it can train at speed. It can do predictions at speed. And so you can imagine that you just keep, you're like this little circular wheel, you're just going over and over and over again. Um, and you get better and better results. And the technology also gets faster because it has the ability to compute and process faster. Um, and this is, the, this is where you get that um, kind of benefit. Um, but it clearly needs more data, right? Um, and so one of the challenges is when you start to get into things like um, medieval era scripting, for example, um, there is there is better training data than there used to be, but there still isn't as much as there is about current day, um, for example. Um, and the same with handwriting. You need lots and lots and lots of examples of how people write to be able to do that handwriting. But um, hopefully that yeah. you know, helps to understand the process. And that comes back to it being better, isn't it? That you might, like our TV systems and our phones, you might run it at this time and then come back in a few years and want to run through the process again to see it improve and what that looks like as well. Yeah, there's always guarantee it's going to get better, um, but that's not a reason not to start today. <laughs> and then, yeah, we're coming towards the end, but I just wondered, like we've had some questions about discoverability, and I always find it really interesting, these like network graphs, discoverability, which is different, obviously, where a lot of our systems are still that long scroll, you know, and I suppose we move towards that network graph and people knowing where to start, because at the moment, you basically you put your search term in and then we get this list, isn't it? And it is that sort of following it through. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it also, this, the use case that we have with search is you're looking for something specific, right? Um, you know what you're looking for. Um, whereas that, that sort of a network graph is about things that you may not have known to look for and it's about surfacing those. So I think it's about another, it's also about another use case. Um, and I think with all technology, regardless of this or anything else, you have to start with how you want to use it. Um, and what is the problem you're trying to solve for? It could be speed, right? Speed of describing. Um, again, I, another museum example, because I come out of museums, but um, maybe this applies in libraries as well. The, the collections that are backlogged for description in museums is mind blowing. You know, um, the museum I had, I think that there were, it was a gift that they were given in the 1960s that is still there waiting to be catalogued, right? Um, and, um, you know, 50 years later or 60 years later. And, you know, come back to something I said before, which is all this knowledge is just like up, waiting to be unlocked. <laughs> and, you know, how can, we, how can we get this done faster? And no one's ever gonna say it's the same as uh, someone who's been academically trained, um, but it's significantly faster and it's a good first draft. Um, and definitely worth testing on your data to see how it applies. And if it doesn't apply now, come back in five years <laughs> um, and see how much more the technology has progressed because technology just goes like this, it's crazy. 